Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me. And now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. Welcome everyone. Today I'm here with David Lithicum, a good friend and an extremely excellent technologist. And we're going to talk about what is enterprise architecture, why enterprise architecture matters, why technology projects fail, and how to make technology projects absolutely successful. Before we begin, uh, Chris, my chief operating officer, always wants to talk about a few things that are going on. And then we will get into the discussion. We'll speak for about an hour or so. We'll give you guys about an hour to ask questions because I want you all to have the absolute best architecture careers. Between David and I, we have over 50 years experience in cloud architecture, application architecture, network architecture, AI architecture, and enterprise architecture. 
And we'll be here not only to give you the information on why enterprise architecture is so critical, but you'll be able to ask us questions so you can build the ultimate cloud architect career, enterprise architect career, AI architect career, because all these architecture careers are really very common. They're all about optimizing our client's business. We are not engineers. We are architects and engineers are very critical and architects are very critical, but there's a major difference between them. Chris, I know you've got some announcements you want to talk about and then we, David and I will get into the conversation. Absolutely. I won't take long. I'm going to mention a few things. I'm going to ask Alonzo to say a couple of words and then we'll just send it off with you and you and David. So the first thing I want to do is I want to welcome everybody to 2024. This is our first episode of the year for Head in the Clouds. This is our third year doing the show. Can't believe we've been doing the show for go, starting our third year now. So this is this is exciting. Uh, glad to have David here with us to start it off. A uh, great way to start things. But the first thing I want to make sure everybody is aware of. So Mike and David are going to be talking about enterprise architecture today. But also this evening, we've got a enterprise architect webinar uh, that we're going to be doing at 6 p.m. Eastern time which will be roughly two hours after the end of this Head in the Clouds episode. Uh, on that webinar, Mike uh, will be discussing, continue, continuing to discuss the enterprise architecture role um, and what enterprise architect is and the skills and training necessary to become an enterprise architect. So if you're interested, join that webinar. It'll be great, completely free on Zoom. You can come off mute, ask questions, interact with us, all that fun stuff. Also, while we're on the theme of enterprise architecture, we have a enterprise architect development program, training program that is launching February 12th. And it's currently in pre-sale right now with a 50% off discount uh, through February 12th. Once it goes live, that pre-sale discount goes away. So if this is something you're interested in, Take advantage of that pre-sale discount. Lock in that 50% discount now and have it take advantage of the, the training as long as you desire. And because the uh, enterprise architecture training, these are things that we're going to continue improving on. And in theory, the business and uh, leadership and communication skills, all of that are things that you can carry throughout your career with you. So uh, take advantage of that. Learn more by joining the webinar tonight. Reach out to us by email, ask us questions here on YouTube, whatever you want to do. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure everybody knew of those two things. Alonzo, anything you'd like to say before we let them uh, take the show? Absolutely, absolutely. David, it is always a pleasure to see you, learn from your experience, couple this with the conversations you and Mike have. Um, if you haven't given uh, David a follow on LinkedIn, he's got awesome articles and posts to help edify your career, help edify your skill set. So I definitely strongly encourage you to do that. Gentlemen, I am ready to get into it, find out what you guys have to share for our audiences. So let's get going. All right. So I'm going to disappear, me and Alonzo, and let y'all have fun. Ah. How's it going, Mike? How, how are you today, David? Excuse me? I said, how are you today, David? I'm awesome. It's a great 2024. I'm looking for an amazing year. Uh, I think the technology uh, is going to be even more important this year to the success of most businesses out there. So I'm looking forward to the evolution of understanding and how we can do this stuff better. And I'm with you. Uh, so, David, is how many years have you been an architect now in some way, shape or form? I think about 25 years. I was five years into my career as a developer when I shift over, shifted over to a designer and was an enterprise architect for mostly legacy systems at the time, uh, and then focused on that as a career path and did the thought leadership thing and became a CTO a couple of times, always focused on the patterns of success and how people are leveraging architecture and how the configuration of technology to align directly to the business leads to success and not doing that well uh, leads in bad, bad directions. So always focused on that as a core discipline, wrote all my books, uh, done all my speaking events, things like that around that discipline, how to use it right, how to make it, how to make it use and really kind of look at this stuff in a very pragmatic way, which we should be doing right now. I totally agree. You know, for those of you that are new here, my background started in network engineering for about six months, and instantly I moved into network architecture, which turned into solution architecture, which turned into enterprise architecture, cloud architecture, and the two. And they're very similar, but a little bit different. 
because David and I both have a lot of experience, but we both have had different jobs, I'm going to ask him for his definition of what is an enterprise, what is enterprise architecture, and then I'll give you mine. And you know, there's going to be a lot of similarities and differences because we've lived a different side of this. But I want you to understand that an architect is not an engineer. David, how would you define enterprise architecture? Well, let me type that into my chat GTP uh, engine here. Now, what, what enterprise architect is someone who understands the business and is able to align technology directly to the business, both the logical technology that we're leveraging, databases, networks, things like that, as well as physical instance of instances of technology we need to acquire to live up to the requirements of the business. It's someone who is able to look at the, the technology in an enterprise as something that's living and changing and needs to be monitored and, uh, and recreated and recreated over time uh, to bring the most value back to the business, which is the role that they have. And I love David's explanation. My explanation of what is an enterprise or what is enterprise architecture, it's mapping technology to the organization's business needs mm -hmm. by understanding the organization's business goals, understanding how the business operates, re-architecting processes, and then selecting the right technologies, regardless of who makes them, to optimize our clients. So you can see we're fairly in alignment here. Now, David, in your experience, enterprise architectures are mostly business. Would you say that? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say it is mostly business. I would have probably answered differently 20 years ago because I consider myself a technologist, not as a business person. But um, in my role as an enterprise architect, I, even my role as a CTO, uh, it is sitting with the business and really kind of understanding what the business is doing. Because I found if you don't do that, you're not doing your job as an architect. The technology is easy, by the way. Your ability to understand and comprehend the business is the hard bits, as they say in England, and your ability to pick whatever technology to make that happen something you do after the case is going to be rather obvious once you understand the business problems you're looking to solve. And, you know, David, you brought up a good point. When I took my first architect job 25 years ago, it was much more technical than it is today. They were, I mean, I still wasn't configuring the technology or implementing it, but it was a technical role. We were down there in the weeds. We were getting geeky and having fun with it. I enjoyed those times. But in the end, the problem is we were designing tech and it didn't map so strategically to the business. And... In the end, we designed solutions, but what were we really solving other than technical problems? And I love that, you know, now we're in a place that are there. You know, David, it, uh, McKinsey estimates that 70% of technology projects fail. Good article in CIO Magazine, I know you read it as well, where they talked about, you know, 50 plus percent of all cloud architectures being failures. I know what I think they're caused by. What do you think they're caused by? I think they're caused by misalignment with technologies and not understanding the core uh, core issues of the business is as simple as that. I mean, the ones that I run across, and I, I've done a lot of fixing of those kinds of architectures uh, in my last 10 years of my career, it always traces down to a single factor. Um, the inability for the folks who are making the decisions around the configuration of technology and the technologies to leverage to understand the attributes and how it should be mapped directly to the business. They missed that part. In fact, I, I blogged about it today in InfoWorld. I talked about where humans are, you know, ultimately the core reason that uh, that cloud fails. And if you look at the patterns, it's a lack of leadership, it's a lack of business understanding, jumping too quickly into the technology solutions you just mentioned. And really it's not doing the blocking and tackling that we need to do to understand that we're getting to an in-state architecture that's going to be optimized for the business is able to bring the most value back to the business. And that's the core metric. So we forget that in many instances and therefore fail the business. Even if we get something that works, if it's not optimized and say it could cost 10 times the money, uh, drag the business back, take resources uh, away from things that sh they should be investing in right now. And the business ultimately fails around that. And so you have to understand the importance of that role. You're, the technology is becoming the business. Uh, the IP that we define within the business is going to be defined by the technology. So enterprise architects play a key role in really kind of creating the, the vision where everybody's moving after, creating the strategy, and then getting the technology that works, that's uh, custom designed, custom configured for the exact problems that we're, um, we're trying to solve. Yeah, and you know, it's very interesting. As you know, I came from internal medicine many years ago before I went into tech. And internal medicine, you know, we always had an idea what to do, but we always asked our patients a number of questions. We identified the problem, and then we crafted the solution that was right for our patient. 
And I say this because I deal with a lot of people that have been certified but not really trained as an architect initially. And they take a certification. It's like, if this, then this. If this, then this. If this, then this. And I say, imagine having a doctor that says you can only have the yellow pill today or you can only have the purple pill regardless of what your allergies are, what your conditions are. And I feel the same way. I feel it was to when we initially made our architects 25 years ago, they were techies. They were the techiest of the techies. Ah, oh, now you're a system designer, but what are we designing for? And then I feel like we've got these AWS and Azure and Google certifications for architecture, but there's no architecture in them. They're literally about the name of something and how to configure it like a sysadmin or a cloud admin. There's no business acumen. There's no leadership skills. There's no uh, presentation skills. There's no sales skills. There's no executive presence, no CXO relevancy. I wish they would just silly, simply rename those as cloud administration things. And I think it would help people understand their careers that they can't get a certification now and actually learn architecture. Yeah, architecture has been overly used, I found, in the last uh, 10 years. And it is where you get into um, name cloud brand architect, uh, name cloud brand security architect. And you look at what the content's about, really nothing to do with architecture, maybe a bit to do with engineering, but it's about understanding in the narrow some specific technology. By definition, that's going to be counterproductive for an architect because architects really need to be master in understanding a breadth of technology, how networking networks work, databases work, governance work, security works, all those sorts of things without digging too deep into any particular discipline. And I think that the way that these cloud skills have been sold and skills in general have been to dig them into a particular narrow, narrow uh, portions of technology and in doing so, um, and I know the reasons they're doing it because there's normally a well-paying job that comes along with those certifications, but they don't necessarily build someone who can make key decisions. They don't build somebody and someone who's going to think strategically about how you're going to use that technology more effectively. They're going to be able to solve tactical problems. And I like to have tactical problems solved on the, on the architecture teams that I work on, but I don't want them to be the architect. I want an architect to have a holistic understanding of the business of the technologies going set the strategy, be able to explain it to everybody, be able to do board level presentations, be able to uh, work with the CEO, work with the CIO, able to manage funds, manage budgets, and then make the tough decisions uh, in many instances that goes against the grain uh, in terms of uh, having an open mind in terms of the technology you're looking to leverage. So in other words, it's going into an organization that maybe uh, we're all in a particular cloud brand and using another cloud brand or going into an organization we're all in with the cloud. We're not. We're only going to do cloud only, and then making a recommendation to use a mix of uh, a mix of on-premise and cloud-based systems is the ultimate value solution to make that happen. So it's making the tough decisions that I think businesses really kind of understand now have to be made. In 2022, we saw the big cloud bill come in. People were quite upset with the fact that they were paying a lot more for cloud and a lot more for their IT infrastructure than they thought they would pay. And it was 2.5 times normally. And and by the way, that's not just picking on, on cloud technology. It's everything. All in stuff, colo providers, managed service providers, things like that. And they want to look at some at the core reason why that occurred. And I explained to them, you didn't have a strategy, you didn't have the leadership in place to make the tough decisions to get to an optimized architecture. Now you're going to pay for it because you have something that's grossly inefficient because the decisions weren't made in your favor. So you now you need to take steps and take resources away from the business to fix things that are already implemented to get you on the right track. And I think there's no reason why businesses need to do that. Yeah, no. you know, David, it's interesting you mentioned that. I would say that's the most frequent conversation I've ever had. I've seen two major problems in the last 25 years. One is architects need to be jack of all trades in some way, but the engineers that are building it, no. And I've seen the engineers that get certified in 10 different people's careers, but they don't know anything well enough to actually do the job and they make errors. The bigger problem that I've seen is why'd you pick this tech? Well, the guy on our team liked it. Why'd you pick this tech? Well, we got a really good deal on it. Like, okay, but which problems do you intend this technology to solve? Well, we need it. We need it. So I've had that same conversation, which brings me into skills. You mentioned a lot of them. I'm going to give you my cloud architect, I'm sorry, my enterprise architect skills or cloud architect skills. I think they're similar, but an enterprise architect more busy. And I'll have to get yours. I think that business acumen is the most critical skill for the architect, or one of the most critical, because if you don't understand the business, how are you designing a system to improve that business? I feel that communication skills are really critical because no one hands us a piece of paper that says build this. We're not engineers. I love engineers, but we've got to go get it. 
The other part of it is we're constantly communicating with people and we're delivering some bad news too. You know, I see what you've done and here's how we're going to fix it for you. And, you know, that's going to ruffle some feathers. Uh, emotional intelligence and precision communication skills and the ability to have difficult conversations to me is essential. Now, one of the problems that I've, I've dealt with my whole life, and I'm sure you have, is managing all the stakeholders. Because this department has different goals than this department that has different goals to this. And the security people are at odds with the tech people who are at odds with the programmers who are at odds with the network people. And somebody needs to manage that. So I would say stakeholder management. I would say sales, too. Because we're either selling the vision to executives or we're selling to a client. I would say we have to be able to lead people because, you know, we're not going to be building the stuff ourselves. We're going to be leading a team of people somewhere along the line, whether it be a proof of concept or how to do things. I would say executive presence because if you come, can't come across like an executive, you're never going to get, uh, nobody's going to take you seriously. I would say writing skills because all of us are writing thought leadership documentation, like your fantastic book, The Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing, or your great blog on InfoWorld. They're fantastic, and I recommend everybody read them because I think they're, they're really stellar. And then I would say, you know, those are your kind of businessy sort of skills and presentation skills too, but then you get into the tech, which in today's world is network, data center, and cloud. And I mean, I'm counting cloud as AI because it can be done in the network data center or the cloud. I'm counting it as compute. I'm carrying it as firewalls or whatever the things are. Those are the skills, network data center and cloud design skills for anybody in any architecture role, whether it be a cloud architect or enterprise architect. What do you feel are the most critical skills for architects? I think I got to agree with you on the business skills. And and I'll, I'll share with you my own personal journey. When I first started out on this, uh, this journey in technology, I was a developer, uh, you know, wrote books on C++ and, uh, you know, did a lot of talks at developer conferences and just hardcore in, into the technology. And, of course, then morphed into more leadership roles, tactical leadership roles, running small projects and things like that, where you did have to have the architects and, and did make the connections. But the lack of focus on the business and lack of communication skills, which I had in my 20s, um, really didn't serve me very well. And I came to an understanding that if I was going to do this well, that it wasn't my ability to, uh, you know, code C++ in, uh, you know, in, in a very efficient way. It was my ability to communicate with my leadership, my ability to understand the business, my ability to do things that I would view as uncomfortable. Uh, uh, in other words, stepping out of my comfort zone. And in doing that, um, I filled in some gaps that I felt I needed to fill in. I still had the technology understanding, so I can understand what technology should leverage where and what it should do. And I could ask the questions. I could talk to the networking people and the security people and the database people and, and, and motivate them to move in, in the right strategic directions. But I also had the ability to go back and discuss things with the business go back, discuss things with the board of directors, go back to the CFO and get a budget, go back to the uh, uh, CEO and tell you know, he or, uh, sh he, he or she, you know, what the ROI is going to be coming back from this particular architecture we're working on, which was something that was completely missing. And it, it probably was the fact that we're not taught that in computer science school. We're taught how to write, uh, how to write compilers and how to, you know, do, uh, you know, direct memory management and, and to do, a, do assembler. And those were skills I really didn't use very long. It was good to get me on the right track to understand how to how to solve problems with technology. But it really would have been it really would have done me well if I would have been someone would have pulled me aside and put me into a business class or sent me off to an executive MBA program because I had to learn that through the hard knocks. In other words, I had so many fail I learned from my failures as I learned to understand the business and then finally figured out how to do it. But it took me about a 10 year ride. Uh, to come to that conclusion. And so right now we know that. And, you know, one of the things, the messaging we should give today is folks are in a, on a technology path, absolutely fine. And I know why people are on the technology path, but you have to have the balance in terms of understanding the business because you're not going to be able to select the right technology unless you understand the business, unless you understand, you know, what ROI is, unless you understand what strategic value is, innovative differentiators, and the ability to have this talk with stakeholders in the company take, talking a language that they understand. If you start talking about serverless versus uh, container and Kubernetes-based technology, their eyes are going to glaze over. They don't care. All they care about is the business response, the ability for you to build something that's going to provide some sort of a value differentiator that's going to return the most value back to business. So you have to, as I, as I always tell people, good architects uh, have a duality to them. 
In other words, are able to participate as a business executive and participate as a technology executive and be able to context switch as they need to in operating their daily lives and really have these conversations with an empathetic understanding of what you're saying and how people are going to, you know, take your information, take your technology and deal with it. You know, David, it's so interesting you say this. I got very lucky. When I started at Cisco, I don't know what what made me do this, but I said to my manager, my manager's manager, his manager, and the VP of sales for the region, and I said, I want to be the best. So anything you think that I could do better, please tell me, because how else am I going to get any better? And they looked shocked. And I'll tell you, we were doing a CISSP boot camp, and my manager pulled me in the side, and he's like, Mike, Stop at the certifications. He said, you're a CCIE. He said, you're really technical. And he said, that's only going to get you so far. He said, if I could help you, I would tell you that it's about the impact you can make to your customers. And that means improving your communication skills, getting that business acumen to actually know how to solve people, learning how to build our own models. They said, Mike, nobody buys a billion dollar architecture because they feel like spending money, Mike. They do it for business reasons. They talked about how to lead. They talked about how to sell. And he said, you do that. You get the best enterprise architect job you can imagine. Well, I did. And a year later, I did get that great enterprise architect job. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we run mentoring programs. Because we don't want people to just go out there and get a certification and have their career die right then and there on the spot because they don't have the skills. And that's why we do so much coaching. And I have experts like you on the show so people can understand. You don't need to make these mistakes. You don't have to fight for it for 10 years if you know how to go in the first place. Imagine you, if you actually knew what you knew then when you were younger or me, you know, it would have been so much easier. So that's why we do this kind of career development around here and have people like you on the show, because we want others to not have to make the same mistakes that we did. You know, you can either make a mistake and learn by failing, which is fine, because you took the guidance of an expert, which I think is usually preferable. But, you know, the choice is ours is how we choose to do this. But, you know, you actually said something in there, which is pretty, pretty also important. You said, and today, the technology is the business. And I really love that because in today's world, the businesses that don't have the best technology or the most agile, and by best, I mean best for their business, they're not going to be able to compete. Especially as organizations become supercharged with AI and what AI can do. And now that people are aware of what AI can do, you know, I've been working on AI for 20 years, but you know, now that people realize what they can do and they can see it and they can feel it, Everybody's investing in AI. And I think that's the next thing we're going to get wrong, too. <laughs> Unless we have good AI architects like you, they're all going to flood their money in the thing that they think is the most exciting, not understand what problems they're going to solve, and then realize they've got to go fix it. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's already happening. Um, and I kind of view the movement into generative AI as very much like an accelerated movement uh, that we were moving into cloud back in 2009, 2010. So, New technology, everybody put put a lot of uh, viability into it. We saw a lot of momentum in the marketplace, a lot of hype. Um, probably some overselling of what cloud technology can do was always sold as uh, uh, completely 100% cost effect, uh, cost cheap to cheap to be cheaper, uh, which the, we're finding that's not the case, and it wasn't the case then as well. So here we are, you know, facing the cusp of the ability to kind of change core systems in the business to get into a state where it is going to have an innovative differentiator. It's going to be able to provide a better customer experience, automated supply chain, you know, all this goodness that generative AI and even and traditional AI machine learning and deep learning can bring to the table. However, the use cases you pick are far more important, even far more important than the cloud-based stuff. And, you know, we, we just did some replatforming things. It was things that we, we could probably easy, f easily fix, even though it was expensive. We could push it back on, on the platforms where they came from or modernize in the cloud. But right now, if we're picking the wrong use cases for this technology, we're not picking the business problems that are really viable to solve with generative AI. We're just going to end up spending a lot of money and not necessarily get the value back. Generative AI is going to be inordinately expensive. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of processing time, specialized processors, GPUs, TPUs. They're expensive and they they burn more power. Um, also takes takes more storage with the training data and the knowledge models that we're storing. So if we're going to invest in that, it's going to be very expensive. We have to be uh, very adamant about making sure that the value is there that's going to be brought back into the business. So I'm seeing people trying to take 
traditional transactional business systems and and bolt an AI engine on it, and that's not the that's not what they're there for. Um, so it is looking within your organization in terms of what value can be made by leveraging this technology and getting someone who knows what that is and what the right use cases are, and then making the business case for each of the problems that you're looking to solve. And we had this problem, uh, you know, back when the uh, other AI uh, hyper wave started, you know, back in the mid eighties, when I got out of college, uh, I was an M1 programmer, list programmer, and I rode the AI wave for about three years. And the problem we had then was the same that I'm seeing now. People were misusing and misapplying the technology. We're using it in use cases that, uh, that that were just um, counter were uh, weren't the correct use cases for the systems, and those ended up being complete failures. And people were spending twenty million dollars and getting no value back from it. And I was part of the problem too because I was a technologist. I was selling AI. I think when I went out and talked to people, now we have the opportunity sitting in front of us. We're able to consume this incredibly powerful technology that has the ability to transform our business. And you were absolutely right. I mean the the. Uh, the technology really becomes the business. And we can either get that right and have a business strategy around how we're going to use that technology, apply it in the right places and apply it in areas where it's going to have the most bang for the buck, uh, apply the resources that we have in strategic ways. So the value is going to be brought back to the business. And that requires a lot of strategic thinking about how we're going to leverage this technology. It's really taking uh, the whole cloud idea to the next level. We can do a whole lot of good with this technology. We can build some amazing systems. I built them the last few years, but we can do a whole lot of harm if we're not considering the business in how these solutions are brought forward. And that's the part I think people are missing. I just see everybody enamored with the technology. All the cloud conferences have become generative AI conferences. Um, you know, 90% uh, of my day is not spent on talking the difference between uh, cloud storage, block, and object, and and uh, and and file. It's talking about different uh, generative AI versions and application of the technology and talking to the press. But we're not spending enough time in understanding the patterns of problems that this technology can best solve. And I think that's where that disconnect is going to get us in trouble. I think in three years, we're going to have a, a huge... Uh, bent in the press, we're going to have this big generative AI hangover where people said, well, we misapplied it. We didn't use it in the right domains. We didn't have enough business people who were helping us make the decision in terms of how that where this technology should be applied. And some businesses, by the way, are going to get uh, uh, so hurt, they're going to go away um, because or they're going to get picked up at a song. So it's game changing stuff, um, but it'll kill your business and it'll save your business. It'll make your business a superhero or make your business uh, a complete failure. So in how you leverage this technology, I just see it coming. And if I look at the, how we're going to modeling these systems, uh, we're not going to have the opportunity to make as many mistakes as we did in the past. So your ability to understand the value of this and apply it in the right use cases uh, leverage it as a true force multiplier for your business is what we need to be focused on right now. And notice I said business, not just technology. Yeah, and you actually alluded to two things. You get attend these conferences and everything's to get everybody all excited. And I need this generative AI. I need it. I need it. I need it. But they never talk about the why. So this brings us back to why enterprise architecture is so important to me, or AI architecture, or cloud architecture. We need somebody to evaluate. And usually it's the enterprise architect, but a good cloud architect will do it, and, and anyone else would be. What are that business goals? What are they trying to do? Where do they want to be? What problems do they have? And then, you know, evaluating how does the business operate today and how could we make that better in the future? And then, then we start looking at what the data architecture needs to look like, what the network architecture, the cloud architecture, the AI architecture needs to look like to go solve those problems. And then it's a whole mess of figuring out, you know, the governance structures and things like this, which is why people, they have this perspective in their hand, in their hot mind that they're going to be an architect and they're going to be coding and configuring and building the things they design. They don't understand that they're going to design it and another team is going to go build it and another team is going to go maintain it and another team is going to go fix it when it breaks. So, I mean, I think that makes enterprise architecture or any other private architecture there. In fact, I'll ask you, I would think that whether it's the CIO or the enterprise architect or that lead architect, I think they're the most critical person on the technology team to make sure the investments work. 
They are. Um, they are. And they should have uh, the influence to, to make the decisions that they need to make. Uh, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, you know, some of the issues we have is some of these organizations are very politically charged. Uh, so they're not thinking in terms of what's best for the business. They're thinking in terms of what's best for them personally. Uh, I found that a few times or best for their organization or best for their career. Um at the end of the day, we have to have leaders in the organizations that we can trust to make the right calls, even if they're unpopular calls. Uh, and those kind of leaders are fairly scarce right now. It seems like I ran into a lot of them uh, in the 80s and 90s. And for some reason, they just kind of fell out of favor uh, in terms of not being awarded, or those behaviors not being awarded. But I think that needs to make a comeback. We, we have to have very influential men and women at the top of the organization that are able to make the right calls at the right time uh, to put the resources in place that are going to take, you know, take the game to the next level and have a strategy in mind and be able to teach people what that strategy is. Uh, I wrote about this in the InfoWorld blog. I think it was today or it's coming out on Friday. Um, core to the people not being able to um, figure out or why they fail at cloud is they don't have an overreaching strategy and nor, nor can they explain what your strategy is. And one of the things that drives me nuts is when I go out to a client site and I say, hey, okay, I know you're building this, but how does this thing fit into the overreaching strategy of the business? In other words, you're selling tires, okay? Um, what is the strategy for you selling tires over the next few years? What's the, whole, what, what's, what's the holistic idea of how we're gonna declare success? And very few people can name that. And uh, the ones who can have not spent the time to teach other people about that strategy. So they may understand it at the top, um, but they may not understand it at the lower level where actually things get done. Even the, the architects and the project leaders, things like that. That missing that chasm really needs to be filled in or else people are gonna be off kilter. You gotta remember, we kind of moved into a, a federated uh, development infrastructure. People don't sit in the same room like they did 20 years ago and sling code. They're all over the place working at home. They're working in pods that are connected via Slack channels and they're working on their own things. They're making their own independent decisions and they're doing things that they feel are right, but they're not living up to a more holistic set or a framework that really is defining the business. And that, that lack of those things occurring is killing us now because we're going off in different directions. You know. Cloud complexity is a big issue right now. And if you look at the essence of why cloud complexity kind of came around, uh, cloud sprawl, or we're going to call it, and we have to invent new things like FinOps and SuperCloud to fix it, um, it was basically a bunch of disconnected pods of people, uh, five to 10 people working together without communicating one to another, without a common strategy, making independent decisions, which you should encourage them to make. But did not have an idea and how what they were working on fit into a larger strategy. So they had an instance of an application or an instance of a solution that they felt was living up to what they were asked to do, but it really didn't uh, it really didn't add any value to the business. Now we have the same sort of thing with generative AI. We can spend lots of money and get rid of stuff and things like that. So it's okay to use that technology. And I, I encourage people to get out there and use the technology. However, we really need to create a higher level business strategy and have everybody understand the strategy. One of the things that I actually insisted on in the days of a CEO is that everybody understood the strategy and what we do and could recite it. And I used to quiz them on it all the time. I was annoying. But the reality is by knowing that, everybody could figure out how they're incrementally working to that end goal, that end state. And also they loved having a vision. They loved figuring out where we're going. I wasn't making tactical decisions for them. They were making their own calls in terms of what technology to use, things like that. But the goals and the objectives of what we're looking to move to, everybody had a common set that we were applying to. That needs to be universal worldwide. And by the way, the enterprise architect is the core leader of that. So they're able to take the business strategy, define it into a technology strategy. In other words, a meta architecture, holistic architecture, how we're gonna uh, approach this thing in the wide and then assist people in defining technology instances and how we're gonna approach it in the narrow. And by doing that, we have a high likelihood of, of hitting the target that we need to hit. The ability to leverage technology is something that's going to be a value driver within the business, something that's gonna become the business. We're heading this way. I mean, I see it right now. Um, the way in which companies use technology is gonna become directly to the value of the business. Study after study is showing this. It gets into your ability to uh, leverage technology as a true force multiplier 
goes into how much your stock is, how much dividend is going to be paid. Uh, and you got to remember as a business, your objective is to return shareholder value. Yes. And so you should be focused on leveraging technology correctly. And that's the key. Most people do not even don't understand that in a publicly traded company, the CEO's fiduciary duty is to increase shareholder value. So they have to make decisions that are going to be strategic to that. You know, you brought up a couple of things that I thought it was like when I used to teach architecture many years ago, like 20 years ago. Uh, and, and if I could do it on a project with other engineers that were Cisco that wanted to be architects, I'd say, okay, now let's go try to buy the product if we could. Let's go to call the tech support number and see what it feels like. Let's call the customer service number and see what it feels like. Let's ask the department heads. Let's ask the guys and girls that are on the ground what they're doing. And then we'll also speak to the executives and see if they align. Because a lot of times the executives have a goal, but they're subtly, 20 years ago, they were so divorced from what happened on the front lines, they didn't always know. But you brought it up. We've got to get all of that. And then the people know what, what they're working towards. They know where the goal is and they know how to achieve the goal. If it's siloed off and people keep asking me about how I feel, another magazine said, how do I feel about this new tech officer? I'm like, look, I don't need a thousand tech officers. I need one really good owner that's got a lot of good advisors so the owner can make the best decisions. And they need good, 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 strong advisors, kind of like running any business, a country. You know, you can't do it all yourself. You've got to be able to depend on your team. So I love the way you put that. Thank you. I think it's I think it's very important. I think it's a big mi missing uh, link today in people's ability to, you know, take their business to the next level. Um, and it is a bit confusing to people when I explain that to them because they go, "Listen, we spent all this time understanding the technology. I have a technology career path. I'm moving off to development, moving off to databases. You know, whatever SME and whatever technology is there. I have to understand the business too." Um, I don't get that. Let's have other people who understand the business and I'll understand the technology. But to your point, they have to be the same person. They have to be the same group of people. And this is not something where you're trying to um, vote on things. This is something where you're going to have an uh, um, autocratic leader who is able to make the right decisions. And then they're watched and they are advised. Um, and so they shouldn't be able to make bad decisions without being checked. But the thing is, if you're centralizing the decision making, you're going to have a much more stronger chance of getting to the end state if, unless you're decentralizing. We talked about the complexity issues earlier. We, we're just federating too much. And I understand why we're doing it. But unless there's a single common coordination, there's a single executive that's guiding this. And it can't be a committee, by the way. That's dysfunctional. Um then you're not going to achieve the goals you're looking to, to, to move into because everybody's going to have their own ideas. Everybody's going to have their own policies. Everybody's going to have their own understanding of what the technology is. Most of the time, they're going to be in conflict because there's no you know, mind meld between these various systems. And they're going to make mistakes because half the people are going to go off kilter with picking the wrong technology sets moving forward. So you should learn from kind of taking a positive direction, learn from the companies that are able to uh, leverage technology in exceptional ways. And uh, so companies that are able to provide a technology set and an understanding have a common strategy. And if you look at the ones who are successful out there, they're the ones with the, with the very autocratic leadership. Um, they're the ones where they have centralized understanding and centralized management of the systems. Uh, they normally don't have a lot of consternation because everything's explained to people when they join the firm and join the company in terms of where they're moving, moving to go. And they're exceptionally efficient at what they're able to do. So, you know, my advice out there is uh, mimic those companies or basically learn from their successes. And so and if you look commonly at what they're doing um, and the results that they're finding, they're getting huge amount of optimization and success with the technology. And, and by the way, when we, when I looked at and did some studies on how, what defines success and what defines failure and just looking at the cloud stuff, um, the people who failed and the people who succeeded spent the same amount of money, uh, cause people used to fail. They used to say, well, we pulled our pockets inside out and said, we didn't have enough resources. We weren't giving enough budget for us to succeed, actually they're spending the same amount of money. And so the innovative leadership, the centralization of leadership that occurred with folks who are successful with any technology, cloud computing, generative AI, you know, enterprise architecture, traditional technology, um, 
had had the same resources, but they were able to make use of those resources better because they abstracted up into a single common uh, vision or visionary where they had an innovative vision, able to take some chances, understood the risk and drove forward. So everybody followed a very influential leader, very innovative leader versus everybody trying to figure it out on their own. So that's what's missing. But by the way, that's only about 20% of the companies that I look at, and I would say 10% are excellent at it. So that means there's not many people out there that are listening to what we're saying here. They don't they don't get the fact that uh, the lack of value really kind of comes down to not understanding how the business meets the, with the technology. Everybody's still floundering with the technology and trying to figure out where it's going and what it does and talk about trends. And, you know, it's like people come up to, up to me at uh, after conferences, they always ask the same question, what's the best cloud? Um, that's not the, that's not the question you should ask. So we just need to put a little bit more common sense in how we run this stuff, how we do architecture. And people have to accept the fact that I learned after many years that the people who are dealing with the technologists and making the strategic technology decisions have to have an outstanding understanding of the business. And if you don't have that, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. You know, when you said, what's the best tech or but what's the best cloud, the biggest challenge I had when people came to me, they're like, Mike, which tech should I use? Which router should I use? Which uh, electronic health record? And I said, well, let's first figure out how you work. You're a hospital. You want to use an electronic health record. How do the nurses do your job in your hospital? How do the doctors do these things? How does the patient move from point A to point B? And they're like, how, what? the first one said, what's that have to do with technology? And I said, well, all these technologies you choose are going to affect how people do their job. So let's figure out your optimal workflow, and then we'll help you select technologies. I got to tell you, those clients all did great. And I did a lot of healthcare architecture. And it and made sense. You know, I used to I come from an internal medicine background. I've been an architect. So I did a lot of healthcare architecture. And I led an entire healthcare vertical at Cisco. So love that world. And then you look at people who did it the wrong way. What's the best tech? And somebody gave them an answer. Oh, it's this. Well, Prior to the electronic health records, medical errors were the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S., with 98,000 people dying annually. Mandated electronic health records, what's the best tech? Now medical errors increased to the third leading cause of death, increasing by over 250%. Because, you know, nobody looks at the way we work. So I know when I used to practice internal medicine, I'd see a patient, I'd ask them some questions, I'd do an exam, I'd make a diagnosis and give them a prescription. And then I would spend about five minutes writing up the chart. Poof, now an electronic health record, it takes 12 minutes to actually put the patient's information in the chart, but you can't afford more than 15 minutes with the patient financially. So now it's three minutes with the patient and 12 minutes playing with the computer. Of course, medical errors went up because the people that were buying it didn't understand the need for it. It was like, I need this, I need this, I need this. So I love the way you said, never the best tech, not the best cloud. What is the best solution for the client's needs right now going on there? I think that's where most technology projects actually fail. Each and every time. I mean, if that's got to be the most common pattern of failure that I see. And, and I guess the most concerning thing is I'm seeing that increase and it should be decreasing. We should be seeing other people fail and learn from their failures. And I, I think the core to the issue is we're just not, we're, we have the demand for technical talent that's going way up and when the supply is not going up at the same speed. And therefore I think organizations are compromising on who they're hiring. They're not getting the training that they need. Probably not listening to a video like this and are missing the mark uh, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what's needed for the organization and the organizations uh, aren't really kind of stepping up. So you're going to have to be proactive and very clever uh, in hiring people and learn not to compromise and do ask the questions in terms of the balance uh, balance between business and tech and the people who drive your business, the executives you need, they should be very carefully vetted. I think I see a lot of leaders out there that are very good, but the majority of leaders out there probably need to learn a bit more in terms of how this stuff is, is weaponized. And the missing that part um, is is just going to be very harmful for the business that are out there. So there's no easy way to fix it. Um, now, I think the demand for technologists and talent is going to continue to rise uh, and the supply is going to continue to flatten. So we got some thinking to do. So are we going to let things get worse? Are we going to stop productivity? 
Are we going to uh, miss hire and hire people who are not qualified to make the core decisions? Are we going to hire people who are, you know, each and every time going to figure it out? They're going to make, you know, five mistakes before they make one success. I don't think most businesses can afford to do that. Nope. So right now, you know, the advice to businesses is think strategically about who's going to be at the helm of these companies and then making sure you get the right leadership. And by the way, there, there are people who normally didn't go to the right colleges or even any college or, you know, uh, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. And so you're going to have to understand that the pedigree doesn't necessarily lead up to an outstanding leader. It's going to be their ability to have the right attitude, right opinion, right set of energy and the right way to communicate and motivate uh, the team and the leaders to make the right decisions. And I can't stress that enough. So we're going to have to rethink how we get the pipeline for talent. We're going to have to rethink how people are trained. Uh, we're going to have to rethink uh, in terms of what the attributes of these executives and these leaders need to have, uh, technology leaders, in order to take our business to the next level. Because right now, I don't think we have the team in place that are going to make most businesses su successful. And so we're going to see a lot of failures, I think, before it's going to get worse before it gets better. I know a lot of people say that, but I, I, I just kind of believe that's going to be the, the pattern of adoption Generative AI and cloud movement to new technology spaces over the next uh, three to five years. But hopefully we figure it out and enough people really need probably to touch the stove before they figure out that they need to get help. Yeah. You know, it's not the cost of the education. It's not the pedigree of the education. You know, I went and did several master's degrees. The one that actually taught me the most about architecture was the healthcare degree <laughs> because that taught me to actually learn to ask the right questions, to not jump to conclusions, and to get all the available evidence prior to making a, a, a diagnosis, if you will, and then not creating a plan until I truly understood the project. I went and did an MBA, and you know what it taught me? Some business acumen, which I love, and then it taught me how to write a 40-page paper cited in American Psychiatric Association format. And what it should have been is, how do I write that 40-page that paper in two pages and get the executives to read it and actually care about it? how to ethically persuade, how to influence others, how to lead, how to sell. None of that stuff was there. So, you know, that's why in our training, we teach all these things because, you know, we only deal with one career, architecture. Now, granted, you know, what we do in enterprise architecture is a little different than cloud architecture. And we put a lot of cloud architecture in our enterprise architecture program because let's face it, in today's world, everything's going to be hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid multi-cloud, super cloud, some kind of scenario like that. It's not going to be anything like in a certification. It's all in a single cloud, all of them. And you're going to use all the cloud proprietary services, and you're, it's going to be perfect for every enterprise disease. I mean, let's face it, that's not reality for most people. Yeah, it's it's not. And uh, I think um, don't focus on the technology. I'm saying that as a technologist uh, because that stuff is going to change. Uh, and so you need to put technology uh, into a domain where you're able to change it through configuration. In five years from now, we're going to be using different technology sets running on different platforms. We're going to be having different discussions in terms of what's the hot trend, all those sorts of things. That's why I decouple uh, from the technology in many instances, because it just distracts me from the overall problem solving of making this happen. So you notice I used to, you know, uh, write and speak about different technology sets, you know, AWS versus Google versus Microsoft. I don't, any, I don't do any of that stuff now because it doesn't really matter because whatever I come up with in this particular instance of time, it's going to change it very quickly. And so why do I want to focus on something that's going to change very quickly and providing an opinion there versus a, providing guidance in terms of what those patterns of changes will mean, how to spot those changes, and how to holistically steer the business so you're, you're getting to the most advantageous position. And that's never going to be about technology. And... However, the problem is, Mike, is uh, best I can figure, there's about $20 billion in marketing dollars that are just focused on the generative AI stuff. Yeah. And there's a lot of messaging uh, and certainly commercials on TV. I see these everywhere now. And people are just kind of following the hype. So do you think that we're going to have uh, an impact in having people understand, you know, the strategy around the technology versus just focusing on the technology, because I still see that the marketing dollars are getting people to focus on particular technology because they're looking to sell something. Are, are we about to make mistakes or do you think people are uh, a little bit more savvy in how to follow technology in a more strategic way? Uh, you know, you mentioned two things that are really there. The first one is something that you highlighted, which is so important. 
focus on the business, not the technology. And when I get a lot of people that want to become architects, they just want to focus on the tech. And I'm like, no, your job is to focus on the business and understand how to align technology for the business. Now, if you want to go back to engineering, focus and be great at the tech, because the engineer's world is the tech and our architect's world is business. Now, you know, you mentioned these marketing dollars and, and it's like, you know, here's what I see. You need the certification. You need the certification. It's not going to be enough to get hired in today's world, but you need a certification. And then there's a conference. Buy my stuff. Buy my stuff. Buy my stuff. We're going to get you really excited about our stuff. And in the end, nobody knows anything. There's no education there. I experienced this many years ago in the uh, in my old life in internal medicine. The drug reps would just come in and try to tell us, you need to prescribe this drug, Mike. Why do I need to prescribe this drug? The real answer was the drug rep got a commission. You need to prescribe it first the best. Why? Could you explain to me how this does a better job than this, 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 and this? The answer was never no. It was like somebody was coming in there, push my stuff, push my stuff, push my stuff. And it always gave me the creeps. At one point, I asked the drug reps just not to come to the office anymore because, you know, unless they learned how to practice medicine, you know, I didn't really need them to try and tell me what they thought they knew when they didn't know. But I'm seeing the same thing with tech. You know, somebody wanted me to write an article, it was a cloud provider, on the things they needed to see at that cloud provider's conference. And I just didn't because it was like, and they, they wanted to reward me by sending to their, me to their brainwashing conference. And I'm like, no, thank you. I understand this technology. I've designed this technology and consulted to all you providers on how to build your clouds in the first place. So no thank you on this. But, you know, here's what is interesting to me, helping people learn how to help their clients be more successful and get past the certification flow. Yeah, it's just it's just maybe the dynamics of human nature. I think that um, you know, if you look at that pattern, it's been like that, you know, since I've started my career. Everybody's yeah. focused on the technology and that's where the marketing dollars are. Even when I've worked in consulting, I've noticed that uh in the consultants find it easier to sell technologies than to sell solutions. Mm -hmm. And so they will focus on and I see consulting firms like this all the time out there, some boutiques. Well, they'll focus just on the Microsoft stuff and the AWS stuff and the and the Google. And those are dangerous because ultimately there's people disguised as uh, an objective third party, as a trusted advisor who are making core decisions, in essence, selling technology yeah. uh, versus selling solutions. And that needs to change. And I think people need to become more savvy about that and start asking questions. Uh, when my, my role is when I was uh, uh, enterprise architect of a big oil company, um, years and years ago, I used to see that happen where people would come in and uh, their focus on particular selling the technology. And my my guidance to them was th that's absolutely not the right conversation we need to be having with you. And also you need to be selling a solution. These were consultants, by the way, I was paying them $500 an hour or whatever they cost at the time. And they came in there and would do a presentation on a particular database uh, that they felt they, without understanding a lick of what we're looking to do. And then you come to find out that, you know, they're motivated by uh, either the market hype or they're motivated in many instances by a partnership agreement where they're tasked to sell the technology. And of course, when, when I back them in the corner, normally I kick them out, but I'm back in the corner, they would say, this technology will work. And I said, I know it'll all work. I can make anything work with technology. If you get enough money and time, um, technology is cool. You know, I could code it in assembler if I had to. It'll work. But that doesn't mean it's the optimized platform that we're looking that's going to provide the best advantage to the business. And they were kind of like looking at deer in the headlights. We're confused by that. Um, why are you looking for that? And when this cool technology is in front of you, and by the way, we can do it, you know, say 50% faster, even though they couldn't, they have some sort of a marketing claim that they would have some sort of a talking point. And I said, it doesn't matter the speed in which we're able to bring this to bear. I have a larger set of problems as a combination of different technologies and the configuration of the right technologies is gonna get me to the value that I'm looking for. You're not selling me that. You're selling me a piece part, you're selling me a tactical technology. And the problem was, like I said, with the marketing dollars are out there, everybody's kind of bought into it. And so they kind of get into this cult-like behavior in terms of how people are moving after technology. It's not complaining about the technologists here. So it's combating that, which seems to be, you know, a, a larger part of the problem. But I, I think people are getting, I mean, I'm, ha I'm being encouraged now because I think people are, are getting more savvy about it. I noticed uh, stuff I write and speak about that's getting hit more in terms of, you know, be becoming the designated buzzkill and focusing on the business and the technology to find the most optimized solution. Who would have thunk it? That would be the right thing to do. Um, and not necessarily all in on every aspect of the technology, but that's what you're battling out there. 
you're battling a huge amount of marketing dollars and you're battling um, uh, people who call themselves trusted advisors that are commissioned sales, third, third outside sales reps for, you know, some of these yeah. companies. And it's a, uh, it's a tough row and it, there's no other business out there like that, by the way, that I, that I've been able to find. So, and that's because I think the solutions and how you come about the solutions are so complex and people don't want to get into the complexity. They just want to get into the simple solutions. It's much easier to go that technology, that technology, that technology than it is to look at the bigger problems. Yeah. You know, in my first network architect job, we had a chief technology officer. And it was for one of the, the largest market makers on the NASDAQ. And I actually learned so much from him. Now, he was not, he never worked in technology before his first chief technology officer position, yet he was the best CTO I ever met that I had worked with. And I remember trying to pitch him on this network architecture. And it wasn't many years after the Jerry Maguire movie. So he said, Mike, show me the money. And I was like, what do you mean? And he says, your multi-million dollar network it changes. Where's what's it going to do, and how's it going to get us paid? And I like that. I really liked that. And then I went back to my desk, and I was thinking the outages they had, and I was quantifying the cost of those outages, and I was looking at the availability to process trades faster. They were a market maker, and what that could do. I built an expected value calculator, sent it to him, and he's like, "You got it, Mike." That lesson learned taught me so much. It taught me that. You know, nobody wakes up and says, Mike, how much money can I spend today? I just want to spend it. Show me how to spend it. There needs to be a, a business case. And that's what I learned. And, you know, we teach so much to our students is, look, businesses have money and they can invest on whatever they think is going to be, give them the best return on investment. It's up to the architect to be sure it's the right return on investment and sell it to them to get that money. Otherwise, they, you never get the engineering in the first place. So. How important would you think sales skills are or consulting skills to a good enterprise architect or cloud architect? It's it's very important. It's one thing I didn't do very well, I think, in my younger days. I'm more of an introverted, you know, tech nerd at, at the end of the day. I don't communicate with people by choice, but uh, the ability to communicate in verbal and written skills and become a teacher, have the heart of a teacher, not the heart of a salesperson at the end of the day, uh, was the best sales skills that I ever had. And so slowing down, being empathetic with who I'm communicating with, stop using the jargon, you know, stop using the the tech speak that we all we all do. Stop using the TLAs and get right down to what this person needs and how you want it to explain to them in a reasonable amount of time that gets across a point. And your ability to do that is really kind of 90% of your sales. They're going to make their own choices. Uh, they're going to, and but you're also selling yourself because if they're putting faith in you, they're going to typically buy your solution. But as long as they understand you're there for their benefit, you're there to basically lead them and take them in the right direction. Uh, that's the best sales thing you can do. If you show up and try to overhype something and pitch things and use talking points, people are very wary to that. They won't they won't be rude to you and uh, you know hang hang the phone up or kick you out of the building, but they won't ever call you back. They'll just disappear. You wonder why people have kind of you've done something that you felt was very effective never heard from them again. Um, that's because they didn't view you as trustworthy because right. you're not making their trust to make the sale. And you have farting, uh, the ability to, to gain someone's trust, hugely hard to do. And it takes time. Um, and they don't know who you are from Adam, but you need to do that in order to get the sale. And you need to do that in order to really, and you have to do that by never lying to somebody being empathetic of what they're looking to do and get at the essence of their problems. Don't throw technology and, uh, and, and uh, hype at them, um, and that works though. Some some instances, throw solutions at them and figure and tell them how it's going to get to a solution. And by the way, have the metrics to show them. We think if we put this solution in place, it's thirty percent more efficient than this other solution that, that's being proposed. And and uh, we have no uh, dog in this hunt with this particular technology set. There's no pre-existing partnerships with them, uh, but we think it's the path that we need to explore, and they appreciate that because we're just trying to move them in the right direction. Um, so it, it's funny, even if it was a detriment uh, to my career, when I was CTO for product companies, for example, many instances, I would tell people, my technology is not a fit. We should, you should really go after my competitor because they do this particular thing very well that I don't do. Of course, the sales guys almost had a heart attack when that happened. But just the ability to make that trust connection with that particular client meant I could be used again because I could be trusted. And that was the best sale in the world. Even though I didn't make the sale that day, 
uh, and, uh, you know, gave the, uh, gave the sales guy a stroke, um, I was able to gain the trust of somebody to become their uh, key resource moving forward. So they use me as information and use me as a source of technology. And that's always the best way to do it. So, and people who, um, you know, try to be something different and not look out for the, what that person's doing, that's antithetical to selling. Your ability to understand and have empathetic as to what their issues are, what their businesses are, what's motivating them, that gets right to selling, selling what salesmen should be and gaining the trust, probably the most important metric. You know, we're, we're more alike than you know, or more people would realize. So I'm an introvert. I've just learned how to act like a non-introvert, like an extrovert. And I can tell you, I remember I first took my first enterprise architect job at Cisco, lead, leading the healthcare vertical. And I was meeting with a very strategic client. And it was ready to be sold. And you had the CEO in the room, the chief nursing officer in the room, the chief medical officer, and the chief medical informatics officer. And the CEO says to me, Mike, what do you think is a proposed solution? And I knew my answer wasn't going to be very popular. I took a deep breath and I said, quite honestly, these are great technology products that are chosen, but the way they're applied will not be helpful to you. It'll hurt you in this reason, this reason, and this reason. CEO said, Mike, okay, now, could you redesign it for us? And we just need what you need. Now, after that experience, the sales route got a bigger sale than they actually intended. So they didn't like totally kill me. I had to travel 200,000 miles that year going to various hospitals around the world because just telling them don't buy this was enough to was enough to say, I need Mike. And in the end, I wasn't a sales rep, but I had brought in staggering numbers of revenue because I would never saw anything to someone that wasn't good. When we had our cloud architect and cloud engineering programs, a lot of the art people would buy the architect program and say, can I buy the cloud engineering? So I get deeper on the tech and I would say, no. And they said, what do you mean? I said, these two careers are exactly opposite from each other. You want to be an engineer? Let's switch you to the engineering program. Want to be an architect? Fine, be in the architect program. But no, you can't do both because you'll fail at both if you try to do both. And I think being honest and ethical with your clients is absolutely critical. The other thing they used to talk about is how to become a trusted advisor, which we, of course, teach in our programs as well. Because once you lose the trust of somebody, your career is over. It doesn't last very long. It's, it's, it's over in most career paths. I do see people who are untrustworthy <laughs> have, yeah. who are, are able to keep their career on life support for whatever reason. Uh, but it's, it's definitely not a path that you want to take and it's becoming more unpopular. There was always a career path for, uh, you know, the swarmy salesman type. Um, but I, I just don't see it moving forward. People don't want to use them. It's no matter if you're selling, uh, you know, cars or computers, um, your ability to gain trust of your customer is going to be going to be core to your ability to make a sale. And that's non-negotiable for most people now. So uh, I think people are looking for that trusted advisor for that friend, someone who's empathetic to their journey. Yeah. And I think it, it's it's critical. And I think we'll get some questions. To me, we have to know our customers. We have to understand their challenges. We have to understand their goals and where they want to go we have to understand how they operate and how they should be operating versus how they're operating and to me that's a big enterprise architect thing right there although any architect should be there whether it be a cloud architect a architect or anywhere and then figure out what's going to solve their problems best for them and still give them the agility and the flexibility to be able to change and adapt over time based upon new business needs and if we can do all that we did our job it's 80 percent of it Right there. It's the hardest part, but it's it's uh, if you can figure that out, I think you got the job. You got the job. You can always understand the tech, yeah. um, but to be able to manage the relationships and manage communications and understand the business is everything to that. Yeah. And, and, we, and we still have to understand the tech or bring people with us that do understand the tech. We can't learn every possible technology that's out there in any degree of depth. No, don't try. As I, that's what I mentioned. It's, uh, I usually keep people around me who have, who have the engineering roles and you know they have key you know, do the network engineering and the security engineering, all these things that I, I, I know a little bit about, uh, can ask the questions, but don't have the deep understanding. So you show up with a dream team uh, in terms of people who can deal with different components of the architecture. And you can't do everything yourself. I think that's uh, that's kind of a fundamental uh, reality of the situation. You have to team with people who have these different skills. And when people that want to be architects or whether it be a cloud architect, solution architect, or enterprise architect, they so want to tell everybody they can do it all themselves. But I try to say this to them. Who would you rather say? 
I'm Mike Gibbs. I've got 25 years of experience and I've designed your architecture for you. Oh, or I'm Mike Gibbs. I brought a team of architects which have 500 years experience combined. People in security, people in networking, people in AI, people in big data, people in this. In the end, it's not about us anyway. It's about what we can bring to them and how, how much transformation we can do. Yeah, look for your dream team. It's, that's uh, you, need, you need that to be successful. You can't do everything alone. I think that's kind of a core thing that enterprise architects need to, need to understand. They're going to be part of a team. They're going to be leading a team typically, become part of an executive team, part of a technology executive team. And getting the right resources around you, uh, surrounding yourself with smart people is absolutely imperative to success. Yeah, surrounding yourself with smart people. I think that's absolutely good. So I'm assuming by this point, there's got to be a lot of questions out there. Yeah. I know people are introverted and shy leaving questions in the chat box, but I know there's some. I'm sure there's a lot more. So don't be shy. We want to help you and build your cloud architect career, enterprise architect career, AI architect career, whatever the case is. You know, we want to help you. Got a, I got a new layout here. Let me try something real fast. I just want to see if it works. No, it does not. It goes over to you. All right. So let's uh, let's get these questions in. So just so you know, Mike, yes, there's a lot of people here, but they are very shy today, apparently. I am uh, I'm, I'm not sure why they're so shy today. So um, let's get to this first one. The first one's more of a comment than a question um, and a nice opportunity for a plug from Jabari. Mr. Lanthicum, I'm reading your book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing now. Thank you, and thank you to Go Cloud Architects for the wealth of knowledge you have introduced us to over the years. So, uh, David, where can people uh, find that that book that Mr. Jabari has referenced here? <laughs> uh, so what, they, what they used to say in the olden days were fine books are sold, but uh, I would say Amazon's probably the best place. All right. So, yes, uh, in, a, in addition to that, I'm sure... You can find it uh, on his LinkedIn page as well. If you're not following David on LinkedIn, make sure you're make sure you're doing that as well. Definitely. So I um, wanted to get that one out. That was actually the first first one. So that I didn't go out of order to give you that plug there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let's see from from Cloud Station. Uh, hi, David and Mike. How can enterprise architecture impact the recently the recent new developments in technology uh, and other things like generative AI? Well, I think I'll, I'll touch on how David touched it because again, we've got similar low experiences but different backgrounds. To me, just asking that is focusing on the tech. Generative AI. The enterprise architect will make sure that the business is understood, that the business goals are understood, that the business visions are understood, and the enterprise architect will evaluate all technology solutions to see what is the most effective way to optimize the business. So that's why I would look at that cloud station. David, why don't you take that one as well? Yeah, um, we just kind of spent an hour getting into what's important about all that stuff, and it's what it, it's X is X is the technology. It's always going to change. You know, generative AI has some certain strengths and and patterns and ways in which we're going to leverage it, and we can get into the microarchitecture and talk about you know best practices and doing that. But again, uh, it's understanding the use cases, understanding the business advantages, where it's a fit and where it's not a fit, uh, and how to use it effectively. That's core to what it is. And by the way, generative AI is going to become some other technology in a few years. It will become some other technology in a few years. It will become other platforms in a few years. All that stuff is going to change. And the problem remains the same, understanding the business and how to back the appropriate solutions into the problem domain. The danger with generative AI is it's really overhyped right now, steaming white hot hype. Uh, and then many instances, people are going to leverage it for the wrong reasons and the wrong use cases. So putting on your architect hat and understanding the business advantages of using this technology where it should be applied is what people need to do right now. And that's what uh, you need to understand around generative AI if you're going to use any lessons. So becoming an architect, understanding the value of the business, figuring out how to configure the technology, now looking at the opportunities for generative AI where it fits and more importantly, where it doesn't. Love that answer. Right. So let's see here from from Valerie. So David, if the technology is the business, 
How would you advise a business to build an IT infrastructure that will strategically implement generative AI? <laughs> what are some of the key metrics to measure success? Well, a measure of success would be uh, the ability for the technology to um, drive value within the business. And so it's a value metrics. And by the way, that's not sales metrics. That's the ability to define whatever value is. So if you're a tire company, your ability to sell more tires is one definition of value. But ultimately, it could be your ability to drive uh, a better customer experience, the ability to drive better supply chain optimization, all these sorts of things. And whatever technology you need, generative AI could be effective there, maybe or maybe not. Um, you know, that would be, you know, where I'd focus. One of the things people do is they look at the use of technology to drive a particular simple metric. So they say, is, will it increase sales by, you know, 10, 20%? That's not the question, is how do we bring, you got to remember that the, the goal, the role of a business is to bring value back to the shareholders and the stakeholders. And your ability to do that is not necessarily always going to be sales. It's your ability to do things better and build more value in terms of the IP that's running your business. My ability to increase sales for, you know, for tires by 20%, that's only going to last a certain amount of time. But my ability to reinvent my supply chain, so I'm able to take 25% of the cost out of, uh, out of my um, raw materials for building a tire, and I'm able to go to market better with a better customer experience. I'm able to provide, you know, direct to consumer technology to sell tires. All those sorts of things are the game changers that you're looking for. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. People are dragged into this uh, sales thing, which uh, is one metric, but it's only a small part of the a small part of the value equation. I'm going to touch on that too, Valerie. So it all depends on what problem we're trying to solve. And what is the business? Does the AI, for example, give people better information so they can make better decisions, better forecasts? Does that add to revenue? Maybe. Does it take cost out of the business? Does the business, can the business operate with a smaller staff or a remote staff and get as much things done? Can the business deliver a better customer experience? We can't define what the technology is for until we know what the goals are. All right. All right, all right. So let's see here. Um, Elijah says, I'm currently using your cloud architect development program, preparing to become a cloud architect. Uh, in this program, can I learn enough to become an enterprise architect? Thanks. Elijah, no, we have an enterprise architect program to teach cloud architecture. And if you're a current student, you can upgrade for a relatively nominal fee. Send an email or a Slack message to Chris. He can assist you with that. Our cloud architect program is designed to train cloud architects. Sure, we do have a little enterprise architecture bias there versus technical architecture, but it's not enough. The enterprise architecture program will have to do with much more business process re-engineering, much more related to business architectures and more business acumen because they're gonna be more, more critical skills. But we still do cloud architecture training and our enterprise architecture training, and there's a crossover between the two. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I, I understand this one, but I'm gonna bring it up in case you guys might be able to help me. Mohammed says more businesses in the market require more adaptive solutions and technology. Will businesses, will business race, race uh, trying to figure figure out what they're, they're asking. So I think I interpret that as uh, the businesses out there are going to be, need to have uh, architectures that change around different technologies that emerge. Uh, and so um, what should they be focusing on? Should they be focused on the adaptability or the technology? That's why that's why I read it. Okay. What do you think, Mike? I think people need to understand what the business is, and only after we know what the business is can we even think about it. Kind of like a doctor. Before they can prescribe a medication, they need to know what what disease they're actually trying to treat. And we don't know that until we have a long consulting engagement with our client to figure out what's going on. What do they want to do? What do they need to achieve? What are their pain points? And without that, it's it's all just guesses. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, at the end of the day, also, too, is a good architectural pattern is to make sure you're not going to couple down to a particular kind of technology. 
you're going to put the technology into a domain that's going to be changeable over time. And that's going to provide you with a with a better adaptive architecture, which I think is the point you're looking for. And we learned this in the past. We made tightly coupled architectures at our peril. They couldn't be changed. Uh, they locked us into a particular technology. And companies had to suffer through um, paying to rechange those architectures. So we learned our lesson. You should be as you're building these systems. You know, make sure that you're putting the technology into a particular domain, understanding that the technology is going to change. Your core architecture, your business problems are not. They're going to remain very constant, very much the same. You need to be adaptable to those problems, but you also need to be adaptable to different technology solutions. All right. I called people out earlier for being shy. Richard says, I'm not shy, just taking notes. <laughs> Uh, well, listening is always good, Richard, and I know you, and I think so much of you. So it's good to see you here. All right. So here from Vernon. Vernon says, just out of curiosity, what is the average salary for the enterprise architect? Well, I can I can tell you based upon what Cisco would do, but I can also tell you I know what other people are earning. So it's Cisco. About twenty years ago, an enterprise architect was a quarter million dollar a year job. Now that job is about three to four hundred thousand. You can verify that on say salary.com. It's a grade 13, which is the same as a director. Most of the architects that I know over the years are in the 250 to 500 thousand dollar range. And what and the reason that is is we're combining two skills. We're combining business acumen. If you go to salary.com, you can see the average salary of someone with strong business acumen is about 558 a year. And then we're combining architecture which in and of itself is a multi-hundred thousand dollar career for a real architect. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, an engineer that calls themselves an architect. I'm talking about someone that can be at home in the C-suite, someone that can lead a large team, someone that can understand the business, someone that uh, can manage the team of engineers and architects that are going to craft the overall uh, technology solution with their assistance someone they can present to the board and get finances and someone they can manage all the stakeholders and get their buy-in. That's what I'm seeing. How about you, David? Do you work with a lot of people? Are you familiar with these things? Yeah, you're, I think you're spot on as far as the numbers go. I think that uh, if you do work for a consulting firm, you can count on a $50,000 premium because kind of the job's a pain in the butt because you're traveling all over the place. You're not sleeping in your own bed. Mm -hmm. But you're also able to expose yourself to more problem domains than working for a particular industry company, uh, which is fine and depends on what your needs are. But it's a well-paying gig uh, and it's going to have a lot of job security. But Mike's absolutely right. You need to have someone who has a duality, understands the basis of the technology, but also understands how, to, how you're going to have the business conversation. Uh, right now, they're scarce as hen's teeth. That's why they make so much money. So people who can gain those skills will kind of write their own ticket. Yeah, it's very scarce to find somebody that actually understands the tech and the business in the same person. And I, I run into fewer people and fewer people. Yeah. And I love jobs on that supply and demand curve where basically there's big demand and no supply because that's the best way to a higher salary. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So Carlos here says, uh, I currently own a pool repair business and I've decided to switch to cloud. Uh, I'm barely learning about the OSI model since I'm a beginner. What would you guys recommend for a beginner like myself? Well, I'll start Carlos as an architect. We need to understand what your goals are. If we're going to architect your career, what career would you like in the cloud? Would you like to be a cloud architect, an enterprise cloud architect, a data scientist, a DevOps engineer, a cloud engineer? See, every one of them is a completely different set of skills. So tell us your goal, and then we can help you get there. Yeah, definitely. That, that's always, always the way to answer it when we don't know exactly what the role is. So, uh, and, and maybe you don't know what the role is. And if that's the case, Carlos, let us know that too. Because uh, as you said, you're, you're new, you're decided to get into cloud, maybe, maybe you're not sure what the role is, but if you do, let us know. If you don't, let us know as well. That'll, that'll help us figure out how to give you some guidance. Absolutely. And as it turns out, we've got a live webinar tonight. It's focused on enterprise architecture, but you know, there'll be a question and answer session. If you want to come live on zoom for a couple of minutes, I'd be happy to consult with you. Absolutely. Great. So we'll, we'll see if we get a response back from Carlos and we'll come back to that if we do. Okay. So from CCNAC, 
how do you see the role, this is for both, how do you see the role of enterprise architecture evolving in the next few years? And what skills do you think will be crucial for success in that field? David, you want to go first and I'll go second? Yeah, I think it's going to evolve to uh, um, basically do have a better focus and understanding of the business and how to return value. I think it's got to move in that way. I mean, obviously, the, the technology is going to change and your ability to keep up with it and understand it and have conversations with other executives on the role of the technology is going to be there as well. But the reality is, I think the skills of what an enterprise architecture is today is fairly evergreen. If you get the business acumen, you get understanding of the processes, you get to at the ability to ask questions, you get the ability to teach people, communicate a strategy, all those sorts of things. Those are the most important things I've looked for. The technology is going to change. I'm sure you'll be able to keep up with it, um, which is going to be fine. But your ability to have communications, understand the business, uh, and then configure the technology great to align to the business is going to be your core skill. Yeah, and, and I feel the same way. It's all about having strong business acumen, having good leadership skills, having good sales skills, having executive presence, being able to communicate well, be able to present, being emotionally intelligent to talk to people. Because this world is all about obtaining information and fixing broken things. And if you don't have those skills, you'll be ruffling feathers all day. And it'd be like my house when the two cats come and the fur starts flying everywhere and it's just not a good situation. So it's mostly those skills. You get those skills, and then you get a good, strong understanding of the fundamentals, technology fundamentals. And here's why I say technology fundamentals. You know, 20 years ago, I was, well, 25 years ago, I was well, in 1998, I was running IAP Sec over a private line. Last year, AWS announced a new press release. Hey, you can run IP Sec over a direct connection. And see, it's the same technology that's 25 years old. Cisco NetFlow told us what our network traffic looked like, and Amazon has VPC flow logs. It's the same thing. And whether it was a VLAN, which turned into a virtual machine, or a private VLAN, which is much like a container, you know, most of the tech is the same tech. It's just been renamed, been tuned, and re-optimized. So get good, strong fundamentals and learn what is the tech, how does it work, and why we use it. Not how to necessarily build it, but how does it work? And if you truly understand that how does it work, it doesn't matter where the tech is and how much it, mo it modifies. You'll be able to stay up to date. I am muted. Sorry. So Carlos says, I want to be a cloud architect. So let me bring back that original uh, question. Currently I own a full repair business and is barely learning about the OSI model since they're a beginner. What would you guys recommend for a beginner like myself interested in becoming a cloud architect? Well, two things. One is Chris or my team will pop a link to a document that's how to become a cloud architect. And it will cover every skill you need to learn. Two is, I'd get architecture training if I was you. And we have a cloud architect program and we've got to take plenty of people with no background and get them hired. And here's the thing. You, I, you, no matter what you do, you have to understand that this is not a job of getting six certifications. Getting a sysops or a devops certification has zero to do with architecture. This is a job where you have to learn the underlying technologies. And what are they? They are networking technologies because they're the same. Like They are data center technologies, and then there are cloud technologies. And really, all a cloud is is somebody else's network and data center that they rent you space in. So if you truly understand the network and the data center, you understand all clouds. So the next piece to understand is you can't just understand a cloud. 98% of organizations are multi-cloud, so you've got to learn the technology under the hood. Then... You have to understand where to apply the technology and how the technology pieces and parts fit together to solve individual problems. Now, what problems are you solving, Carlos? Business problems, which means you've got to be able to understand how to read balance sheets and financial statements. You've got to understand how to communicate to the CEO, CFO, CIO, CTO about what their concerns are. You have to be able to understand those business goals that they have and figure out how to create a strategy around that. And part of your strategy will be the technology solutions you architect. And then at some point, you're going to have to sell the technology to the organization, convince all the key stakeholders that they're interested and learn how to manage multiple vendors. For example, even if you're on AWS, you might be getting routers from Cisco, 
security devices from Palo Alto, applications from, say, Oracle or SAP or whatever, you're going to have to put all those pieces and parts together. But download that free guide that we have. Follow us because we only focus on architectures. Read David Lithicum's book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. It's extraordinarily good. Read his blogs on InfoWorld. Read all the articles we write in magazines. And uh, I'll have David answer the second half of that question. David, do you want to add anything to that? I think you answered it well. I mean, the other thing, too, is uh, is decide that this is the right path for you. Understand what an enterprise architect is and make sure it's something that you want to do. Uh, one of the things that uh, I find in many instances, certainly with the cloud jobs, uh, you have people who enter that line of work because they, they view the money as being good and cloud architecture is no different. So just kind of make sure it's something if you're a problem solver, you get excited about uh, communicating and solving issues and working with people, uh, working with people who are implementing technology and working with ex executive leadership and things like that, you know, which I do. Mike does, too, I guess. Yeah. And it's something you should do, but just kind of make sure the pattern is something. I do see a lot of people who chase the money uh, and they do get the tactical certifications, things like that, end up in a career path that isn't not, not necessarily to their liking. And I think that, uh, you know, that's a bit of a risk here. Just kind of make sure it's it's something you're going to be able to get out of bed and every morning excited about what you're doing. Because I'll tell you what, they can pay you $10 million a year and you can still be underpaid. If you have the wrong, wrong yeah. job. And I and and that's such good guidance that came in a uh, David Carlos. Most people that I found that we train for architectures love that job. Now I'll tell you who often doesn't, sometimes doesn't. The people that love being an engineer, and they love being hands on in that tech. Often they want to go to architects, and if they want to be an architect because they love architecture, it is a great move. But if they're just trying to be do do their same job and earn more money. They'll, they're not going to be happy as an architect because they're not going to be writing code anymore. They're not going to be configuring. Heck, they shouldn't even be doing their own proof of concepts. There's other engineers in the back end that can do it for you. So if you are obsessed with configuring the tech, architecture is not the right career. Now, most people that come to me know what an architect is because they listen to us and they, they want to be architects. But if you want to be hands-on, this is not the role for it. That's absolutely right. I, I gave that up uh, years ago. I just understood it was going to be uh, the way I needed to manage my career. Um, also, I understood I couldn't be effective at both levels. So I either had to be a good architect um, and not participate directly in engineering or be a good engineer and not participate in architecture. You can't do both. Uh, okay. It's you, Your brain just doesn't have the bandwidth to do it. So pick pick one path. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get caught up here on the questions. Um, a lot of so, them flying by. Let's see. Uh, the coder from above says, is enterprise architecture a super business architect? No. <laughs> okay. So you can typically think of your management and strategy consultant as a business architect. You can think of your, your enterprise architect as a hybrid between a business architect and a technology architect. And then from there, you go into your further domains of cloud architecture, which focuses on more cloud stuff, and security architecture, which focuses on more security stuff. So I've been a business architect. I've been a cloud architect. I've been an enterprise architect. I've been a network architect, a solution architect. I like them all. David, would you just, how would you describe that? I mean, a super duper architect sounds like a good role I'd like to step into. Um, yeah. Uh, no, you, you have to remember that they have a, they even though they have a wide role and a wide responsibility, you kind of have to figure out what your domain is. And so you you can't, you know, get into this business leader, I'm going to, you know, take on value metrics and I'm going to take on uh, executive coaching, <laughs> which I've seen before. Uh, you need to become the best architect you possibly can and make sure you define your lane, what your goals and objectives are. Uh, and, and don't try to make it something you're not because it's yeah. just not uh, people aren't going to receive it well. You're not going to like the reception that you get and you're going to you, you're, you're not going to be as effective. All right. Um, let's see. So from Alexander, what would you recommend? from someone with a non-traditional tech background to, to effectively demonstrate their skills and character resilience. 
Uh, I asked because the current talent search structure seems to filter them out. I'm also an introvert with empathy and honesty as a superpower. So back to back to the first part. What would you recommend for someone with a non-traditional tech background to do to effectively demonstrate their skills and character? So Alex, I know you. The first thing that is really going to help you is you are extremely good. You need to have confidence in yourself and a visible confidence for the world to see. Because if you, if you can't show confidence to the world, you're going to run into trouble. Quite frankly, I can't write a blog article without getting a job offer. I can't. And, you know, whether it's Yvonne Tamba or Jordan Kitko or Coyote at AWS, they didn't have a tech background either, but they were doing quite well. So, and whether it was Balwinder, who was a stay-at-home mom at Microsoft, or Wallace, who got hired by J.P. Morgan Chase as an enterprise architect, or... Daniel Bosa, who didn't even graduate high school. So the jobs are there. But I can tell you from knowing you, you need more executive presence and you need more confidence because once you get the opportunities, you will be there if you can just prove it to them that you're strong because you've got the skill and I know your skill. But, you know, David, what's your experience on blogging and showing articles and creating great content as a means? Or do you have another means for people to show their skills that you use? No, I, I do that as because uh, I enjoy doing it. I'm kind of at a saturation point now, but also um, it, it does open up career opportunities for myself and did more so in the past. And so your ability to kind of get your thinking out there, expose yourself because you are doing that you're writing something that's very personal that you're you're putting your thoughts out and people are going to provide feedback on the thoughts you know makes me it makes you a bit vulnerable but um i think to kind of mike's point you know what i would do were I you not knowing you mike knows you but um i would drill some interviews with some friends in other words i would uh you know, just talk to, you know, if you have a partner or a friend, somebody like that, and uh, interview with them just as a mock interview. Because if maybe something's not coming across uh, in terms of your ability to define your value to them. And I, I think in doing that, you may hone your communication skills, which may be the essence what you're missing here. It just sounds like your your technology skills are uh, are there. So get your thinking out there, get your thoughts out there get a LinkedIn account, get a Twitter account, post your thoughts, um, do so with the heart of a teacher and the heart of a salesperson, you know, don't get, don't get bogged down and put it in, uh, in rabbit holes in terms of, you know, controversial things, but, you know, teach people how to leverage technology, tell people how you think about something, you'll get feedback and hone your, uh, you know, hold your communication skills around that feedback. People will care about you. They'll give you good feedback. They'll start try to send you in the right direction. And eventually you're going to find somebody that uh, is willing to make an investment in you and uh, and bring you into the organization. All right. And uh, in case Mike forgot, I know David probably doesn't know, but uh, as Ruslan points out, what a day. First, we had the opportunity to talk with Oscar from Google. Uh, in class earlier, we had a, we had a somewhat a employee from Google that spoke to our class who was part of uh, the Go Cloud Careers program. So that was good for our students. And now they get to hear from Mike and David. Again, what a day. <laughs> um, Samuel says, I have an AWS Solutions Architect interview coming up. This is my first Solution Architect role. How should I prepare for this role interview? Well, Samuel, you already started preparing for the interview when you made your resume. Because when you get the interview, they're going to ask you the things that are on your resume. So I make sure you can understand and explain in extreme depth every single thing that's on your resume. Because if you can't, and I got to tell you, 99% of the interviews I've conducted over the years, people have stuff on their resume that doesn't correlate, that they can't explain, and none of them get hired. Because we view them as someone that's lying to us because, you know, the resume doesn't match the skills that are there. So be able to describe everything in your resume. Make sure you can give an extremely good presentation because part of this process will be a presentation. They will also ask you to do a very basic, simple architecture. They'll ask you to solve it. Honestly, won't relate to for most, it is going to be very, very basic and they want to see if you can actually design it. So it's going to come down to your communication skills, how well you explain technology. It's going to come down to your leadership skills. It's going to come down to your sales skills. It's going to come back to your executive presence, for example, I, here's with no presence. Hi, everybody. 
I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. So you're going to have to have that executive presence. You're going to have to be able to give an award-winning presentation. You're going to have to sell that audience with the why they need your solution. And if you can do that, you will be great. David, you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I'd add, if you're dealing with a human a human HR person who's bringing you in for the interview, and they're not typically someone who's going to interview you, you it's perfectly legitimate to ask them uh, um, maybe three sample questions that you that you uh, would, will probably get in the interview. And they're happy to help you because they're interested in getting you hired because that goes to their metrics. Yep. And they'll tell you exactly, you know, what the interview's like. And also make sure to go to Glassdoor, uh, some Reddit sites, things like that, if information's about the company and what it's like to do the interview in the company. So you can kind of prepare yourself a bit more. But, you know, Mike's absolutely right. Um, you know, make sure you don't oversell your skills and uh, say, I don't know if you actually don't know and be willing to answer the questions and best you can with a very positive attitude. And I'll tell you what, if you do that, you're probably better than, you know, 80% of the people that I run into. But uh, I, I did find out from HR people that they're, they're asked all the time, what are the common interview questions you're gonna be asked? They're happy to tell you that. In fact, they view that as a positive. But yeah, yeah as, a, as a former HR person, absolutely. Any, uh, I, I was the head of hiring at one point. And uh, yeah, if any, anything that showed any indication that they were actually interested in being prepared was always a plus. And so asking what type of questions, uh, you know, even if I can't answer it for you, just the fact that you asked it is going to, uh, I'm more likely to give you more tips that I might be able to give if I can't give you, give you questions to answer. Because it, it is in, it's in everybody's best interest that the people that they bring in for interviews actually be able to do good on the interviews. Because <laughs> people doing interviews don't have a lot of time in the world, so. Exactly. And it's in everyone's best interest to want to hire somebody that's motivated and is a problem solver. And if you ask the questions and then learn based on these questions for them, you're a problem solver. And that's what employers want. Yep. Oh, and trust me, they'll remember if you asked and then you weren't prepared for those questions that they told you was going to be on there. They'll remember. Oh, wait, I gave this person the answers. They weren't prepared. Oh, okay. Moving on to the next person. <laughs> it's exactly uh, the, it, it, if you ask for help, use the help. <laughs> and I don't know how far in advance your interview is. We actually have some extremely good interview training that we offer to people because we're super successful at getting people hired for cloud architect and solution architect jobs. All right. So Brian asked any tips on how to extract business information from non-publicly traded companies? Yep. Ask questions to the executives, to the business people, uh, as many people as you can find from the clients. That would be my suggestion. How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, use Glassdoor. I found that resource uh, pretty handy. I always advise people to do that. They normally uh, also, um, uh, you may even want to talk to people who work at the business. If you have a LinkedIn account, uh, figure out who works there. And and by the way, if, if uh, unsolicited uh, message that how do you like working there is something people get all the time, I get all the time. And uh, it goes to, again, you being enthusiastic and proactively looking at various things, and that's going to go into, go to your benefit. And uh, so use all those uh, use all those resources to find out all you can about a business, even if it's publicly traded and they do have a 10Q and all that sort of stuff. It's still a good idea to do that because you will get the candid opinions, things like that. You know, uh, morale's not great or um we're they everybody thinks they're under resource those sorts of things those may be red flags that you ask more questions about that doesn't mean you eliminate that business as a contender for your employer but it's something you want to dive deeper in because in many instances when you get into the business you're going to find out a lot of that stuff is true right so let's see here um to david and mike google said that ai will affect 40 percent of jobs around the world how likely will AI, Gen AI, Gen AI affect the job of a cloud architect? Okay, so Abraham, to me, generative AI get, creates many, many more jobs for architects, cloud architects, enterprise architects. And here's the reason why. As new technologies evolve, they can potentially create a new competitive advantage for business. And it's the architect that does these things. Now, architects can't really be replaced by technology like some other positions, and here's the reason why. You've got to go and learn that business, which means a lot of talking to people. You've got to have a lot of business knowledge to understand the business. 
you're now going to have to lead large teams of people, which means leadership skills. You're going to have to go sell something. And, and again, these are all human skills, skills that AI can't do. Giving a really good presentation and getting people to adopt you. Creating a governance structure. These are architect skills, and they cannot be replaced by technology. Now, to be fair, this will impact other jobs, people like writers, for example. Honestly, this will impact entry-level coders, too, and people that have low-level technology skills. And here's the reason why. AI is almost as good as, as, as the bottom of the, the bottom 30% of our technology professionals are. But AI can, cannot do what a great technology professional is. So on the engineering side, I want our engineers to develop the human skills, the sales skills, the business acumen, the presence, the leadership skills, because people with great tech skills and business skills can never be replaced. Architects, many more jobs, but for the person that's just writing Python code all day long and they're not an expert at it, that's where I'm scared. A blog writer, for example, some, L, uh, or some entry level customer services like the tier one kind of things may be able to be automated with technology, but not an architect. To me, AI creates more architect jobs. How about you, David? Yeah, that's spot on. Uh, looked into it as well. Um, AI and uh, use of generative AI is going to inflect the need for um, for architects, cloud architects, generative AI architects, enterprise architects, people who are able to make the fundamental decisions and how to use this technology effectively, which I mentioned already, is going to be the biggest downside to this technology moving forward. I actually wrote a blog about this uh, about a year ago when I started to inflect because a lot of people were asking me the same question as to whether... Uh, cloud architecture roles can be replaced by generative AI, and uh, absolutely not. I mean, it is going to provide you with tools to do your job better. Yes. You know, I use it for uh, triage in terms of application, uh, application triage and figuring out how to do cloud migrations. I use it to go through massive amounts of documents yep. for me and find common patterns and, you know, be able to discover things faster and certainly doing research. Um, but it really, if you think about it, architecture is net new innovative stuff, which generative yeah. AI has trouble doing. It can provide patterns that it learns, and it's, in essence, putting a mirror up to you as a human. Um, so it's reflecting back what's already been said. Uh, so using to weaponize it, making you, using it to make your, you more effective at your job is definitely going to change the job slightly. But it's going to inflect the need for generative AI architectures. I hear this now. I, I get a, a, a call a day from a recruiter looking for generative AI people. And that's telling me that you know it can't be automated. No, nope. can't be. All right. So we're going to be uh, wrapping up here in the next 10 minutes or so, everybody. Uh, so we're going to be we're going to try and get through as many of these questions as we can. I've got a extensive one from LinkedIn. I'm going to need both of y'all's full attention for this one. <laughs> so, all right. It's a two-parter. And uh, you can't see me anymore. How does one gauge the necessary level of maturity in both technology and business to excel as an enterprise architect? In the context of enterprise architecture, what are the key technological com competencies and business acumen that individuals should possess to be effective in their role? Can you outline specific milestones or benchmarks in terms of technology and business knowledge that mark a mature enterprise architect? What are the fundamental differences and milestones between emerging roles like cloud architects, solutions architects, compared to the broader and more encompassing role of enterprise architects? And how do the skill sets required for cloud architects and solution architects differ from those required for enterprise architects? and milestones to define success in each of these roles. Uh, can you highlight specific challenges or responsibilities that are unique to enterprise architects as opposed to, uh, and then it cuts off, uh, solutions architects? Is the, okay. the so I'll try to take these 10 or 10 questions and try to give you a simple answer. So all in all, let's take the enterprise architect. It's 80 to 100% business where a cloud architect is 50 to 80% business and 20 to 50% tech and a solution architect is more like 50% tech, 50% business. And as you move up from the solution architect, cloud architect, the enterprise architect, the further you get away from the technology, the more you earn. How does, what are the skills? Business acumen, like MBA depth or more. And you don't have to get an MBA, but you have to have that. But you need the depth of, of business knowledge of at least a master, someone with a master's in business. 
You need to be able to lead large teams. You need to be able to sell billion dollar plus solutions. You need to create governance teams and manage stakeholders. You need to know how to ben manage vendors. And quite frankly, you need this on every role except for the solution architect for the most part. And even that needs most of these skills as well. You need to know how to write thought leadership documents, write, uh, write white papers, write, uh, speak at industry conferences. And the amount of business that you need is whatever is necessary to transform those clients' businesses. So there's that. How do you tell if we're effective as architects? You can find some measurable improvement to the business. What problem are we solving? That's the big identifier, and they're going to be different, which is why. So, for example, I would treat a sinus infection differently than I would treat a sore throat versus that I would treat a pneumonia. In medicine, same thing in business. Increasing sales is, is done via different methods as, as opposed to improving operations versus improving quality. What are those metrics, whatever problem we're trying to solve for? And that's really what we're talking about. Now, the competency of an enterprise architect in healthcare is going to be different than an enterprise architect at a bank. And part of that is the business acumen and the knowledge necessary for the industry to create those industry-specific architectures. Enver, I'm going to invite you to our How to Become an Enterprise Architect and what is an enterprise architect and what are the skill sets that we're going to have tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern, about two hours after this ends, and we can have a face-to-face -face conversation and answer them one at a time, and I'd love to do that. Do you want to add anything to that, David, or...? or that was a great answer, Mike. The only thing I would tell you is learn how to step out of your comfort zone and be an autodidact in, in terms of learning. You certainly get an MBA and certainly, uh, um, you know, take some courses online and in increasing your business acumen. But uh, volunteering for roles, working with different people, um, the ability to kind of step out of your comfort zone and kind of away from the technology into the realm of business, knowing that something that uh, doesn't come naturally to you or something you're going to have to learn to make happen is going to be your first step in the journey. And you're, if you keep doing that over and over again, you're going to find the business, uh, the, the business intelligence, the business knowledge comes to you and you're able to use it in conjunction with the technology. And lo and behold, that's what enterprise architects are. All right. So we had a, a question from uh, Augustine. Uh, David, please, what do you think about the TOGAF 10 certification for someone just entering the solution architect space? Uh, it's fine. It's just a tactical, it's a tactical certification. You get to understand it. And I think if it's something they're going to leverage within the organization you're going to work in, uh, it's fine and dandy. But um, uh, if it's if it's not, um, there's you're not mandated to take it. That's that's kind of my take on it. A lot of those things are really kind of canned procedures that are very static in nature. And I think we're moving into a world where you have to be a little bit more open minded in how to leverage aspects of those frameworks and not the frameworks unto itself. And I find these certifications create people that are very adept in a particular narrow knowledge base and a typical static set of, of taste uh, of steps to do something when the reality is you're going to have to step out of that to solve most of these problems now. And so that's my only issue with it. And, you know, Augustine, I have a, a similar but different view. The, I like TOGAF 10 for the following reasons. When people see all the steps that are necessary to design an architecture, they remember they're not engineers. And for that, I like it. Because it's like, wait, I got to manage stakeholders. I got to do this. Oh, maybe Mike's right. I can't be coding and configuring the whole time. I also like it, and for only this reason, is it's good to have one or two certifications that on your resume because it can attract employers. No, nobody will ever hire you based on a certification in today's world. They hire you based on the right skills. But it can be good to get you that first interview, and it can be a good framework to remind you. Start here, go here, go here, go here, and then tune and tailor that framework every single time. But I'm not a big fan of certifications. I'm a big fan on the right skills. But I can't. I, I don't want to see somebody with six AWS certifications because that means they're going to be trained to do all these proprietary AWS things, and they probably don't want to know what to do in the real world. So I pick a TOGAF as like a, oh, yeah, that's your second certification for your resume. All right. So the next one's going to be specifically for David. I'm, I'm, I'm cherry picking this one. Good. And you'll see why. Kingsley says, what do you think about someone who is fascinated about AI and the cloud? Is there an intersection there? What kind of career path can I take? 
Most I think, of, I think David's the appropriate person yeah. to answer that one. Yeah. yeah, most AI is going to be done in the cloud because that's a path of least resistance, whether um, you like it or not. Even though in many instances, I urge people to make uh, platform decisions, build versus buy, because in some instances, buying and having something in an enterprise data center is going to be cheaper than running it in the cloud. So you have to open your mind there. But obviously, you know, focusing on uh, generative AI, a lot of that innovation is occurring within the cloud level stuff. So that's where most of the development is going to be focused. I think over the next few years, it's pretty easy to make that decision. Make that uh, make that call, um, and there's certainly an intersection there. Um, it's the cloud at the end of the day is just a hosted platform where generative AI systems run, and you can do similar things on edge computing, my wristwatch, you know, yeah. the computer that's under my desk, all these sorts of things. So I would not focus specifically on the platform in this case, cloud. I would focus on the general ideas of how you do the architecture in the wide and the generally speaking, and therefore you can transport that to any number of platforms. And then it's okay to focus on how it's implemented on a particular cloud platform. And but for the path of least resistance, I think the cloud and generative AI are just going just going to happen. That's because that's where people are focused right now, and that's where the innovation is occurring. But you should have a completely open mind in making sure you're running on the best platform that's going to be most optimized for the business. And I know for experience that's not that's not always going to be cloud. All right, so uh, it is. Uh, now that time that we must begin wrapping up the show, both Mike and David have, uh, I'm sure they've got plenty of work that is calling their name, but uh, if there's anyone that has any more questions or uh, would like to learn more about enterprise architecture, inter the enterprise architect role um, and skills and training for the enterprise architect role register for our webinar that we'll be hosting in two hours and three minutes uh, where you can join Mike and I and, and uh, the rest of the team. And we will have a good old fashioned time discussing enterprise architecture and taking your questions off mute, uh, not just in the chat box. You can come off mute and talk with us. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, David and Mike uh, if you guys have any last words to, to wrap it up for us. Why don't you go first, David? Yeah, no, go out, learn all you can, do well, enjoy life. Um, and if you find happiness, you, 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 you're on the right track. Always find something that's going to make, uh, make, make you purposeful, happy, and uh, be kind to everybody you can. And I love that. And I'm going to answer one of the people's deep appeals question and actually close on the same thing. One thing to let everybody know is you can do anything you want. If you've done 20, something for 20 years, it doesn't have any bearing on what you want to do in your future. It doesn't. The actions you take today and the actions you take tomorrow determine your future. And anyone can be anything they want if they get the right training and they apply the right amount of effort and they keep studying and don't quit until they win. So there is that. I hope everybody got the, con the concept with David and I that architecture is a business career and it's not a hands-on techie career because I see so many people that want to become architects and they learn Python and they learn SysOps and they learn DevOps and they get great at Linux. And then they go on an interview and someone says, here's the problem, how would you solve it? And they don't know because they've trained for the wrong career. Engineering careers are great. Architecture careers are great, but you don't learn to fly an airplane by learning how to be an airplane mechanic. And I say this a lot because a lot of people try to learn everybody else's jobs. And unfortunately, when you try to learn everybody else's job, you don't learn yours. So know you can do anything you want. Have the confidence in yourself and believe in yourself and go after your dreams. Now, tonight, we're going to talk about enterprise architecture on Zoom. If you want to pop in and ask a cloud architecture question in that, we could probably answer that after this after the questions about enterprise architecture are over as well. I'd like to thank David um, for coming. I appreciate every time David comes. He's an expert in the field. He writes great books. He's got lots of good lessons that are out there. We collaborate on so many things. So thank you, David. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to seeing you guys tonight or, or soon. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>